Hi everyone. Um, very nice to be with you this afternoon. Very weird experience with speaking to a screen when I know that you're all out there. Um, I'm in Toronto, as you probably know, and it's rainy, and I know that it's Halloween, and I was thinking where you might be in the country. Um, I apologize if I'm not making direct eye contact with the screen because I'm between two screens here. And hopefully we will have some time towards the end so that I can actually answer um, any questions that might come in and anything that I might have not covered that you'd ho hope to know about. Um, this topic, don't eat that, you'll get fat, um, and how to feed your teen in a weight-obsessed world is something that's very close to my heart. I, um, as um, Jalisa said, I am I'm been working with the treatment of eating disorders for many, many years. And so many times I also have a young child who has been told by the doctor or been that she needs to watch what she's eating or the parents have been advised that the, um, that the growth charts have gone up or, and, or someone's been told that they're um, fat or chubby. And what we do with that information is so crucial to our, to our children. Um, not every child, um, the feeding environment is not going to be the only thing that will cause a bad, um, a bad body image or a, um, an eating disorder along the way. But certainly that's the power that we have as families to, um, to create much more positivity for our children. So it's no big surprise that we are getting very concerned about our children's health. The Surgeon General warning of the obesity rates going up and the obesity epidemic is huge, has been huge headlines for years. Um, there, was a, there was a report by, this, by CBC saying that um, obesity rates have, been, have, have surged 200% between 1985 and 2011. Um, and we know that by 2019, they pro project that 21% um, of Canadian adults will be obese. Obviously, if you're getting that sort of message in the media, you will do everything to protect your child. As I said before, doctors are also getting the same messages and very concerned about the risks of diabetes, etc. So the media can go both ways both in you are going to be um, fat and unhealthy, so watch that, and also the opposite of the photoshopped um, models and unrealistic expectations about what a body actually looks like, which I'm not going to go into in detail, it's a whole sub subject in amongst itself, of what we're being bombarded with and what our children are being bombarded with. Um, also, there's a whole lot of other media which is much more important to children and to teens, which is social media, between the Instagrams and the um, and the uh, Facebook and Snapchat. I think I'm not fully on top of each one of them, but so much of what my clients will come in with is what they've seen, whether it's a meal prep or a diet or an exercise or an or an image of someone. That's what our children are being um, are, are being fed, and it's very much out of our control. To the most part, when they get to teens, they've got access to media. Um, the biggest, just to, to point out a couple of things that are also happening um, in the health syllabus in schools. I remember when my child was um, was, I think in grade three or four, he had to keep a food record as part of the health syllabus. And he wrote down chocolate chip pancakes for breakfast. And I said to him, no, 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 no please don't write that. Actually lie. Because um, I had made whole wheat pancakes and thrown in a handful of chocolate chips. And I was worried that the teacher, the student teacher, who had no idea what her, her issue was with her own body, whether that was going to result in you've had a very unhealthy breakfast. So in, um, in the States now, there's something being contended because they're having BMI testing and that's being made public and, be, and children are being criticized for having a higher BMI. Um, the, the other thing that I have written down there is my fitness pal. That's being used extensively um, um, amongst teens, to, which is a way of um, adjudicating what a child's eating, how much, and it comes up with so much misinformation that in the Academy of Eating Disorder, it's an oftentimes um, 
conversation thread of what to do about these type of um, apps that many of the many of the teenagers are in, and of course peers. And that, that's, that's what's out there very clearly for our children. Um, so we're in a weight and image obsessed culture. In, in terms of um, what a body image is, a body image, just to be clear, is a person's feeling about what she thinks or feels about her body or his body, and not just about how he or she looks. Despite how someone might appear on the outside, anyone can have a positive or negative body image. You see that very much, obviously, in an eating disorder when you have a very underweight or beautifully looking body and they come in and they feel so tormented by their body. Frightening stuff is that, um, which, um, which um, is not the, the focus of the discussion today, but uh, the Delphi study that just came out this year in Melbourne by Laura Hart is looking at where body image is starting. It's amongst five-year-olds now, that they're looking at how they appear, whether they're fat, whether they're chubby. That's what our culture is about today. So body dis dissatisfaction, why is it such a big deal? We're looking at the fact that six out of 10 girls are choosing not to do things because they don't think that they look good enough. 31% of teenagers are withdrawing from classroom debate because of how they feel that day about their looks. One in five are not showing up to class because they don't feel good about their looks. Poor body image is associated with a lower GPA or grades regardless of actual weight. And these studies have been done in the UK, Australia, US, China, and Finland. So you can Imagine what that's doing to the future of um, women and men. But I'm, you know, so these, these studies were done primar primarily in females. But what it's doing, what it's doing to the future of um, of our of our young population. We also know um, that it, body dissatisfaction affects health. People who feel bad about their body do less physical activity. They ironically eat less fruits and vegetables. They um, diet more, and that obviously puts at risk of nutritional deficiency and risks of eating disorders. And they tend to have a low self, lower self-esteem with feelings of shame and or depression, feeling that the body is actually defective, that there's something wrong that needs to be fixed. And that feeling and that feeling of vulnerability um, can put them at more higher risks of uh, high risk behaviors such as crash dieting, drugs, alcohol, cosmetic surgery, unprotected earlier sex, and that stems a lot from body dissatisfaction according to the research. So what can we do? What can we do as parents, caregivers, um, dietitians, healthcare providers, um, advising families, we can do our best to create a safe and protective environment for our children so that they're having an alternative set of values, set of messages from what's out there, which is so all-powerful today. We have a very limited amount of time with our children as a proportion of hours spent outside in school situations, with their friends, with their, with their electronic devices, compared to with us. So that's the precious time that we have to be with our children and how we can influence. So I am going to be focusing and remembering of a concept of connection, right? Connection to, um, to sorry, I was trying to slide you up, sorry. Um, protection is an attachment to our kids via family meals. Allowance of all emotions, non-judgmental, um, having that moment of, of those times in the day where you're not being judged, being clear about what our own values are. Not about appearance, obviously um, feeling in the, in the teenage years that image is part of it and being aware of one's body is normal. It's about the overvaluing of those of appearance and image rather than other character traits and giving to others and gratitude. I, 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 it brings to mind a, a friend of mine who's, who, who was Australian and um, I'm from South Africa by the way, but anyway I'm making references to South Africa, to Australia here. Yeah. Um, and she, she had a brother who wanted 
an earring because that was what all his friends were doing. And the mother, their family just didn't want the child to have an earring. And she said, she said very unapologetically, in our family, boys don't have earrings. I'm not making a, 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 a comment on whether I believe that boys should or shouldn't have, e have earrings, but there was some statement with a lot of confidence about this is what our family does. So this is what our family values. We value giving to society. We value doing for others. We value what, what you do, that you try, that you are perfect in what you are, and we value you, rather than having that ongoing um, message about what is out there. Connection to food um, in terms of its origin. We are so disconnected from food. Um, we, barely, we barely know where food even comes from. So much in our crazy society of running and no time. We don't know, children forget, we forget that there's farming, there's agriculture, and that that's how the food gets to our table. We don't even remember that that chicken was actually gave its life for us to eat it. That's, that connection is something that's part of it, and although we know some of you out there actually might live on a farm, but I don't, and being able to take children to, to have experiences of seeing fruit, food grown in nature, um, that we have gardening, even if it's on a small measure in the houses, and shopping and cooking, I'm going to be talking about that. Connection to food as taking in the outside world, the fundamental way of nourishing and caring for ourselves. Um, something that I don't take um, for granted, that we, there's a lot of assumptions I find that people just know what food is, that food is there and it's nutritious and blah, 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 blah. And actually, in my experience, the, many people do not know. It's an, it's, an, it's an assumption about what is in our food and how much and how to plan our foods. It's very, there's, it's not as innate that as we, um, as we expect, as we think it is. And then a connection to the joy and sensuality of food, of being able to enjoy food, fun foods. And I'm going to be speaking a lot to this because I think that's a huge issue that we get ourselves in trouble with. And connection to our bodies, hunger, fullness. Um, I'm not going to be focusing on exercising in this, in this presentation. But exercise or movement of the body is a huge way of connecting to one's body. Um, I'm not talking about burning, it, burning calories, obviously, or um, doing it because you ought to and have to. And, but that allowing the body to, to be felt, seeing the feeling that the, the blood is pumping, you can feel that your heart is working and sweating. That often, if you can make that a connected experience, that's very powerful in terms of self-care as well. So family meals, as I mentioned, is a huge opportunity for us to connect. It can be an area where we can foster an accepting, open relationship, which encourages sharing, um, sharing mistakes or negative emotions with no judgment. It's a time for connection and engagement with our child. And secure attachments and I'm talking really to the psychological theory of the attachment theory, where you're really connecting to the initial um, initial research was done um, on infants and attachment with the infant and the, and the mother, but now it's being looked at in terms of relationships. And that can actually, just being together, being in that accepting environment where you listen to your teen or your tween, that you're actually hearing more than talking and controlling, what a gift you're giving to your child. Even when they're looking at, um, at affect regulation, on how people um, deal with emotions and how they can actually deal with feelings, so much of about, about it is validating, hearing, seeing the person, and creating that environment where you can have a space that is sacred, that you will listen to your child, that they've got a place that they can bring things that they're having difficulty with, something that happened in the day, or fears about and anticipation about what's going on in their lives. Creating that time is something that's a challenge, unfortunately. That's actually something that we, don't, we can't take for granted in this crazy life that we have. Focusing on qualities of, the, of a child, the kindness, the charitable, doing good with, the, with their body rather than what it looks like 
is something that you can actually use the family meal as and then as a non-verbal experiential nutrition education experience. Having balanced meals most of the time and I've just included food exposure because um, picky eating is a huge piece of why people, children especially and tweens don't eat balanced food. Having food there and seeing seeing other family members eating it and having more exposure is um, much easier to do when you're in the context of a family meal. We also know that family meals, sorry, technical glitch, wait one sec, there we go, sorry, um, it provides structure or routine and opportunities for communication and connection as I mentioned. Um, Skier and Ballard in a recent study did a review of the literature on family meals as that pertain to adolescent risk prevention and there are eight major areas they looked at, alcohol, tobacco, marijuana and other drugs, aggressive and or violent behaviours, poor school performance, sexual behaviour, um, mental health problems and disordered eating patterns and all of these without showing statistics of how much, all of these had, um, were significantly improved by having family meals. Most of the studies in the, in, in the literature reviews have been done based on frequency of, um, frequency of meals, um, of family meals. Something that I want to point out is that a family meal doesn't have to be that idyllic family that you would see, I don't know, in the Brady Bunch where uh, all the children are sitting nicely with mom and dad and we're sitting there and mom's been cooking in the kitchen for two hours and you know, that's actually quite unrealistic for most, most families these days. A family meal might be for, for some, it might happen only a couple of times a week. That's powerful in and of itself. It might happen at um, McDonald's on the way to a sports meet with two, with two kids and a parent or a parent alone and that might be the best that you can do at that point. But that place of connection is what's most important um, with, uh, within family meals. Um, when it comes to what it looks like in terms of a family meal, it typically, in terms of the studies, have included multiple family members, served family style, meaning that um, family members have got access to more food or less, Usually in the kitchen, about 62% of the time it's in the kitchen, which also implies the informality of family meals. 38% of the time in another room, like the family room or an office. And um, most positive, healthier family meals have shown interpersonal, positive interpersonal dynamics, which I've already touched on. Um, there's been, generally, people who have family meals have lower adolescent um, body mass index, so it does affect weight, and um, higher vegetable intake is one indicator of healthier eating in, one, in an area that, um, as you'll see shortly, that's where a lot of teens don't have enough. They tend to be 20 minutes in, in length, and I know as, um, as the primary um, preparer of meals, there is a lot of prep that's done before that 20 minutes, but if you look, that is only 20 minutes of dedicating to being together. It's not two hours. It's about creating that space that everyone comes together. And as I said before, increased food exposure and the importance for um, nutrition and picky eaters. Um, here is what, I, what some of the more recent studies, when they're looking at what a family meal is about, They've been looking at what I call some funky family meals, where you have um, very authoritative style mothers um, controlling children's eating. Um, and obviously that's going to be increasing dieting risk. Probably that child's better off not being at the meal. 25, this is, I found fascinating, a recent study from this year, 2014, 25% of teens who are at the family meals are engaged in media, electronic media. So they're either watching TV, have their phone at the table, are, are Snapchatting with a friend, so talking on the telephone, listening to music with headphones, playing handheld games, 
that's actually a core. If you actually have your children at the table or have a family meal, ensuring that there are some expectations. By the way, very much about the food and what is being spoken about food or what's being spoken at the table, you can create rules around that, expectations, so that you're preserving the sanctity of that very precious time. In terms of interactions, fathers reported, um, a study done recently, that fathers were reported more conversations about healthful eating and physical activity with their sons, and mothers reported more weight-focused conversations with their daughters. So what sort of messages are we giving our children? Across, across the board, whether male or female, overweight children with higher BMI, there was much more controlling and restriction um, restrictive behaviors around eating and um, con including pressure to eat as well as restriction. Pressure to eat tended to be in the, on, the male sp on the male side, um, worried about the weight maybe not being high enough. But once again, it was not because a child had been told necessarily that they're dangerously low weight. It was linked into body image. Sorry. Okay. So some of the messages or the rules that we can have, be cautious of what you're bringing to the table. No fat talk permitted. No commenting on others' weight and appearances. So when we're having conversations about what someone else might be looking like, or oh, did you see the little bit down, walking down the street where they had this or that? That type of discussion, whether it's about our politicians, whether it's about people that we know, this person who's lost weight, or that reinforces that that horrific experience for a tween or a teen that someone's always watching. Someone's always looking at what and making judgments about about your appearance. A huge part of what I'm seeing in my practice is that family members, especially parents, are on diets, even if it's for health reasons. Paleo diet, the grain brain, um, the wheat belly, and they, and it is so confusing for us as parents, um, as as uh, as um, as people out there in the public, of what is real. There's um, all these doctors. You know, the wheat belly was done by Dr. Davis, um, grain brain by Dr. Palmer. These are neuroscientists and MDs and PhDs, and coming out with with nutrition require, um, recommendations blatantly being the experts, so much so that even as a nutrition expert myself, a couple of days ago I met with an ex-classmate of mine who's, who is sort of the carb king. He's working in, you know, he's, he's went on to do his PhD and he's an MD and, um, and I said to him, John, uh, has anything actually changed with the carb recommendations? Because I'm not feeling so comfortable with, with recommending these things because so much is out there and I'm getting challenged all the time. If I'm getting challenged, how much more so are these children when their parents are cutting out carbs, if there are no carbs at dinner? So even within the foods that are being brought to the table, that's, um, that, is, that is not to be taken for granted. Another piece of it is comparisons, comparisons of bodies, comparisons of qualities. If someone brings, oh, I did, I didn't, um, I didn't do so well in a in a in a history exam. What did that other person do? Instead of looking at the child, did you try hard? Was it so? Really using it as an opportunity to boost your child's your child um, a child's um, self esteem rather than bringing them down. It's something that I say to parents who are worried about their about their child, if they come in without the child, I'm like, if your child is, is going to be that way genetically, do you want your child to feel good about having a very normal weight, but the norm might be not with what our media is, or even within what is the normative 50th percentile weight and height? Even if the child is on either side, don't we want our children to feel good and satisfied and have poly... Um, like positive body image rather than negative. So, the, um, Ellen Satter is a dietitian and social worker who in the 80s came out with the feeding relationship, the, the division of responsibility of eating. Simply put, the responsibility of the parent 
was what was put on the table, what was fed when, structured meals and snacks, and where, so having it at a table. The responsibility of the child was whether a child ate and how much a child ate. Family meals are obviously integral to this, to this model. Um, and creating an eating environment which is positive is what I've been discussing. And Jill Castle and Marianne ja um, Jacobson in a recent book, Fearless Feeding, they speak about the parent in a, in a teenage model becoming the provider of the food, of stepping back and letting the child do what they need to do in terms of eating. I want to suggest, though, that um, the, we actually have more responsibility. A lot of this work was done primarily on children and early feeding behaviors. But when we look at what teens are, it really is the bridge. It is the bridge from being a child to being a competent adult. And um, referring to, to um, Dr. Lerner, who's, who's, the, um, who's at the Institute of Applied Research and Youth Development at Tufts University, he speaks that teens who enjoy a healthy adolescent and smooth transition to adulthood share similar characteristics and outlook, confidence, co connection, competence, caring, and character. And within that, I'd like to inject food and eating. We should be having it as a goal as parents to know that when our child goes off to college or off into their, their um, work environment and out into that world as an adult, we want to make sure that our children know how to nourish and nurture their bodies, know how to self-care in such a fundamental way. And part of that is feeding them, but also giving them the, um, the tools to be able to know how to make a meal. So um, connect to food as nourishment, the transition to adulthood about giving our children that feeling, that that ability and the practice of being responsible, of caring and having competence. Education about anticipating changes in body and, and appetite is so cru crucial to becoming from home. I'll say to um, tweens and teens that, I, that I'll see that when I play with, um, with a young child, um, and oftentimes they have those geometric, like, uh, geometric shape games where they have little sticks and little circles and I'll say how would you make a child and the kid will come very very quickly to I use mainly sticks and rectangles to make a child and I'll say then how do you make a woman well I'll use circles and ovals and stressing how awkward the body is around that stage as it does that transition males females they tend to get um, a little bit bigger and disproportionate, usually around the center. The body will get, will change and sort of store up and before it grows taller. The appetite will change and we can't anticipate the body in terms of growth spurts. So we don't see it. We don't see it when you suddenly get really, really hungry and it doesn't make sense. And to be able to explain that and make it and normalize it, that you shouldn't be shameful for the fact that you're hungrier than what you might have seen on that fitness pal that day, or that um, that everything is seen in a bigger picture of a seven-day approach to eating, that sometimes we're going to be eating more and sometimes we're going to be eating less, and that that's normative, both what's happening with our energy needs and our metabolism and how much our body's burning, as well as growth spurts, which you, that is the highest energy need that you'll have your whole life in these years. Um, so uh, besides infancy and um, you know, maybe pregnancy, but these, this is a time where the body is going to demand. The body is going to change in not such a pretty way. We talk about you know the pimples and the funky stuff. And not, if you're like me, I will not look back too long at those beautiful pictures of the adolescence where the hair was really weird. And but that part is so normal. And this transition is normal. It is so helpful for children to know that. So the responsibility for our own e eating and being able to create that as an opportunity for competence, that meal planning, menus, what, what, we, what we have in our house that are picked up along the way from 
from someone who called it the Try It Tuesday. Having a day where a child can choose the menu, looking at recipe books before and help, and you help them make that recipe and grocery shop around it, and being able to let them be so crucial and, and, and part of how the feeding is happening. Should, um, teaching a child how to pack lunch, I know that for some of you it might differ, but so many adults are still responsible for packing a child's lunch. Being, having that as a, as a part of what is um, a, a life skill, and as a child then goes off to being more and more independent of going out with their peers at lunch time, that you are not shaming it, that you're being able to create that that's fine some of the days, but making sure that things are balanced overall in the week. But being able to give your child an idea, a guideline, not a manifesto, a guideline of how to actually feed yourself, how to shop for and prepare basic meals. Most children who get to, um, to 18, and I'll see them in the summer, the week before they're going to university, they have no idea how to make an egg. They have no idea how to make make a rice or you know pasta even. And being able to get to that point, um, I've got some giggles on the side here. Maybe adults also don't, and but also not making the assumption that people know how to prepare basic meals. You have you have got such a wonderful opportunity to create this as a pleasurable time and not having it perfect, how to manage time and how to um, have realistic expectations. Okay. So basic um, basic um, nutrition knowledge, and I've written that not all of it is by osmosis, meaning that not all of it is going to be coming from those family meals, which might actually realistically be for some people once a week. That knowing how to plan a meal I call it color, fruits or vegetables, protein, meat, fish, poultry, eggs, dairy, legumes, nuts, that that's part of the meal, grains or starchy vegetables, healthy fats, and how to make that into a meal, fluid, the importance of breakfast, eating every three hours, fluid, physical activity, that that becomes a very commonplace way of talking about eating as well, that this is not all art. This is very physical. It's physiology. Our blood sugars drop after a few hours, especially in the adolescent years, and being able to know when your energy needs are so high and you don't meet those needs, what is, going, what is the consequence? What are the consequences? Metabolism might drop if you starve yourself and skip meals. You won't be able to focus in class. You won't be able to um, you, you might be starving later on, which I'll talk more to. Those type of things as that being even preventative. So we're talking in the language of teens and what is relevant to them. They don't want to be super ratty. They don't want to have gray skin. They don't want to um, be starving, starving later on. Being able to know, to, to, to give them guidelines as a self-care this is why you need to eat and this is why you're needing to look after your body being able which is such a crucial piece and probably the biggest thing that I find that I do in my practice is focusing on the foods that they're missing rather than what food they need to watch quote unquote which um, I'll talk to towards the end of the talk but really focusing on what they're missing out on so the, these are just Canada's food, guide, um, food guidelines for healthy living. Look at the amounts of fruits and vegetables that teens are expected to have. Where one serving is a 10 or 4 size of fruits or vegetable or fruits or a cup of leafy greens or a half a cup of cooked vegetables. So the joint vegetables and portion um, serving recommendations are 7 for females, 8 for males. 10 to 6 um, by, from Stats Canada, the last thing the last um, poll that they did, 83% um, of, um, of, of girls and 61% of 
boys are not meeting their dairy dairy product recommendations. Most teens are having less than five fruits and vegetables a day. Isn't that the place we should be starting in terms of um, encouraging our children to eat better rather than focusing, oh, you shouldn't be having so much pizza. You shouldn't be having so much blah, 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 blah. Rather have, what are you having? How do we increase your eating? How do we make your body more stronger and more powerful, more vital and energetic? In 2011, First Lady Michelle Obama unveiled my plate in the States. We've, um, in Canada, historically had the rainbow and the state has had the food pyramid. In 2011, they went to a very visual, easily accessible way of educating, which is my plate. Half of the, the plate being fruits and vegetables, quarter protein, quarter starch. It's a very easy way of educating children and teens. And then you adapt it, right? So those fruits and vegetables, it might be that you have an apple with your lunch and some vegetables. It might be that you have two fruits at lunch because that's you don't like having vegetables and you don't feel like having a chili. It might be that you're having a soup at the beginning of the meal and a fruit at the end of dinner. Whatever it might be, that's a very easy visual guide that that adults and especially children alike can actually relate to. Within that, besides, um, besides the macronutrients, macronutrients being carbohydrates, fats and proteins, which is the primary basis of food groups, we can talk to children about macronutrients to boost nutrition quality. And once again, speaking to teens in language that they relate to, that iron is something like Energy, muscle development, immunity, mood, skin tone, magnesium for sleep, for, and I won't, I won't go through it, but being able to um, talk to them and giving them examples and having that food available so you're actually making them most, most pumped for success. In terms of actual foods, um, there are foods that we can add. Once again, we are responsible for what, what our children are eating. So having the foods available, of having fatty fish and dairy, especially um, especially yogurt, dark green and, and orange vegetables, and being being creative in how we use it, um, making kale chips, putting um, I, I try to put I try to put spinach into my children's smoothie this week. So it didn't go well having that whole green smoothie thing. Although a lot of my clients actually think think that it's fine. The the color totally turned them off it, but many people actually find that very helpful to, to and children like it, that they're bringing food in that's healthy. Nut and seed butters, obviously, the school, you can't do that in, in, some, in, in some schools, but as they get to high school, nuts and uh, trail mixes are huge, putting it into baking, and our children being able to be part of that baking Legumes, including edamame, many teens love taking edamame or being able to make that when they get home from school by putting it in the microwave. And those are simple things, and just while I'm there in terms of microwave stuff, being able to make a scrambled egg in the microwave, being able to give them those tools so that they're able to, once again, nourish themselves um, with very practical, easy um, skills. When it comes to, and I'm just I'm saying, fortified non-sugary cereals are a huge nutritional boost um, um, at snack times. Um, breakfast is something that I'm sure anyone who's interested in nutrition knows that in breakfast there's been so much um, interest and studies done on it. We know that eating breakfast sets the stage for the day. In terms of clinical practice, I see that, people, you know, we know that children have better focus, they have better academic achievement. But the biggest thing that I see is that people who skip breakfast, it's usually an indicator of dysregulation around the eating for the rest of the day and usually mood as well. There's a much higher chance that a child's going to get home from school and overeat when they get home. There's a much higher chance that a child will eat a huge dinner disproportionate because if you think about the energy that's distributed throughout the day, if there's not enough in breakfast, if, if a third of the calories approximately has not been eaten by um, before lunch, there's there's not much of a chance that, the, that there's going to be equal distribution. And it's much easier, although yes, you know, 
difficulty with rising and it might be that there's a healthier muffin that comes from home or, or something that's prepared that's easy. But that's, that, leaving that piece, there's much more um, energy and um, time with your child rather than when they get home from school and most parents are working. Eating at breakfast together as a family is um, much less prominent. We know that one and a half times a week is an average of adolescents eating as a family meal as compared to 4.1% being 4.1 times a week being the average for for um, dinner. We know that children who have um, have breakfast once again focusing on the foods and the meals that they're missing rather than what they need to cut back on, um, they have lower risk for overweight and obesity and they have um, a higher intake of fruits, whole grains and fiber. The next thing that I, I think is so key is key is snacks. Amongst the 14 to 18 year olds, we know that th almost 30 percent of calories are derived from snacks. This is a time where teens are hungry; they really want food. And so, when we're thinking of, I've spoken about family meals. We want to give our children the most chance of success in actually snacking. I differentiate in my practice between grazing and snacking. Grazing is like sheep in a meadow, you know, they kind of eat all the time, they take it, it's a very impulsive type of eating. Whereas a snacking is a much more of a mindful, um, uh, in, intentional experience. And having foods around, as I said, having eating regularly that there's no shame in increased or unpredictable appetite, and being able to educate children once again that you're very likely to be starving when you come home from school. So let's come up with some ideas. Protein is a really good thing to add to larger snacks, um, to manage blood sugar, to manage appetite, and to, pro to provide the protein needed for growth. Most um, common high-risk time is that afternoon snack. Coming home from school, they've had a really bad fight with a friend. Some teacher said some some horrible thing. They just found out that they've got you know 20 assignments, all deadlines for the next day. And quite frankly, food is a very comforting segue into um, into the day. It might be a procrastination strategy. It might be a boredom thing. It might be just feeling so lonely coming home. And it doesn't mean that there aren't more people around. It doesn't mean that there aren't, they don't have siblings around or caregivers, but they're feeling alone at that time. And having food there is such a go-to place. So planning out that um, those healthy snacks with having um, you know food that, once again, teens are missing, nuts, fortified cereals, soups, vegetables and dips, yogurt, milk, even mini meals. For some of my clients, making a little omelet when they came home from school with some toast was actually a very good intervention. If they knew that they were coming home at 3.15, dinner was in their family at 7.38, having a mini meal at 4 o'clock got rid of all of the other sort of snacking 40 cookies because that two cookies turned into a whole other shame experience and that became a, um, a binge-like experience. So being able to create a solution that your child enjoys is um, crucial to that. And at this point, also really looking at what the food environment is. I hate this expression, but I'm going to use it anyway. We're living in a very toxic food environment. Food is everywhere. At the gas station, as I said, when the children are going around at a birthday party, it's Halloween today, happy Halloween, but at the same time we've got that and there's now going to be a ton of junk food. We don't want to have restrictive food environments. But check out what whether your pantry is actually what you would want your children to have. I'm not suggesting that you don't have any fun foods around, but at the same time, setting your children up to have the wrong foods for that snack time is also very important in terms of what we have around. The next um, way of connecting um, I'm, I'd like to suggest is, and I'm going to go back to the um, fun foods concept, is how do we connect food to origin? Like, where? How do we get that? And here's, as I said, it's not farming 
for everyone that this is just a picture of my daughter after apple picking this fall and just the joy that she got of picking that apple and then my son coming home and making this apple pie that sense of connection of where the food came from and what it's going to do is so wonderful for children to get connected to in our house we don't have place for a vegetable patch but we put pots out during the summertime where we we grow herbs or baby tomatoes or cucumbers and having that experience of making your salad in your garden and then being able to cut it and now given that we are going into four or five months of a dearth of, of actual food around us, everything's imported. Preparation of food, going to the grocery store, knowing what you're bringing home, and then having a cooking experience is a, a, another huge way of looking food as origin. Knowing what goes into making a food yummy and um, delicious and what's going to be coming onto the table. So, um, Here's, a, here's another little picture of my oldest son and his friend um, cooking and you know he prides himself on how he can cut up cloves of garlic you know 10 cloves of garlic and does he make a mean pasta sauce with all of that garlic and <laughs> and him being able to have that pride and even if it's one or two foods that he can make at this stage and um, being able to grow it and being able to then generalize it to that skill of cutting up onions and garlic then you can do it as a chili then you can do it as um, ginger and then if you add some vegetables to it and saute it then you've got a stir fry if you add some you know low sodium soy sauce and some maple syrup and you've got something yummy to have with tofu or chicken all of these little skills are huge for our children, our teens going into um, adulthood. Something on the right hand side here is um, a, a, um, something that I've, I've been keeping over the years and might I say not very um, organized and not very every day but what, what those things are cue cards in different colors creating, you know, there's one, the, just looking at the top one, with spanakopita and salad. Going with the same concept, protein, colour, starch, how are we going to make that meal and giving them then ideas. It's got the recipe on the one page and making sure that my children have watched it at least being prepared, even if they're not able to make it. And then knowing that all the yellow ones are the more of the, the dairy-based ones, the red ones are more the red meat. Um, or the fish type and the or whatever it might be I think the purple ones with the red meat so that they know how to make you know meatballs and spaghetti and then there's a soup on the side to make sure that there's the right balance and then the hope is that they are going to have the little cue card collection when they go off to university but all along they have they're having many cooking courses developing that connection to food and their competence around feeding and nourishing themselves the other thing that I've got written there is the very realistic of you, anything like me with these crazy activities, being realistic about that food is not going to be prepared every single day. We need to get into batch cooking. We need to be able to, um, to cook for the week, you know, making whether it's a schnitzel that you put into the freezer or burgers or having sauces that are ready to be pulled out, soups, um, being able to have um, doughs of whatever it might be, marinades, so that at least a big part of the meal is prepared. Usually I focus on the protein and then grow from there. Now, the, probably the biggest piece, and I'm going to try and work through this because I'm, not, I'm mindful of the time, but the big piece, okay, I've been told that I don't have to work through it. Um, the big piece of it is the connection to the joy of eating. Um, we are in this crazy environment of good food, bad food. And then even in the recommendations of people who are more in touch with it are talking about things like sometimes food. Um, where I had a client in my practice, a gorgeous little 10-year-old in my practice, who when she spoke about how her, um, her eating disorder developed, it was when she was at a sports camp in the summertime and um, one day it was 
burgers the next day, it was pizza, and she looked at me and she said, it was no longer sometimes food, it was every day I was having this. And she went and pulled back all her food and landed up losing a whole lot of weight. Once again, we need to be um, focused that we're not looking at foods in, in uh, individuals, macro, macronutrient pawning, um, but looking at the bigger picture around food. So how do we do this? How do we do this and create that balance and create that trusting amount, um, amount about our children? More and more research um, and emphasis is going to um, including all foods without restriction. Reminding our children to eat when they're hungry and stopping to eat when they're full. So, um, I usually recommend that people don't eat pleasure food when they're too hungry or angry or tired or blue or, or bored. Bless you. Um, and that, so that food is used for what it's meant to be used for, including the food that's not healthy, the non-nutritive food, that we're not using it too much when we're when we're using it emotionally. And might I add that that's even normative in and of itself, that you're really tired or you've had. So part of that is being able to have that hot chocolate and really savoring it in, and enjoying it without guilt, without guilt. But how do we do that? Food as reward, just to be aware that that's a risky behavior. Being, be, you know, well done, you did a great, um, great job on that test or you did a great, let's go and celebrate with an ice cream. Obviously, that's part of our culture. How do we celebrate birthday parties? We don't go, yay, you're looking bigger in terms of age and you're doing your um, you know, milestones you're reaching. No, 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 we make birthday cake. That's part of reward and milestones and, um, and being able, that is normal. But what is really something that I, I'd, I'd like to propose that we do more with that that it becomes a time, just like every other food, but specifically the foods that we know aren't nutritive, that we are focused on, on eating healthily and making sure that our bodies are getting all the foods that they need for the most part. Um, and by the way, just to put out there that there was a poster that was presented at the Eating Disorders Conference of the Renfrew Center a couple of years ago that showed that if we say to our children, and now what I'm about to say is very controversial, that um, you need to eat your broccoli and your healthy food before you can have dessert, that that was not actually associated with negative food relationship, relations and body image. It was much more linked into reward. So um, what we're looking at is really empowering teens to make choices. What's one of the most wonderful experiences for a child is for them to say, oh, yummy food, what do you love? What food should we go out and buy or bake together, which is completely delicious, and give them that permission. But let them make that decision without guilt, without shame, so that they're actually listening to their body, because I love this little slide, listen to your body, it's smarter than you. But then that it is coming from um, internally and not just from um, from external voices of ought to's and should be's. Mindful eating, what is that really about? It's about observation, about taking time, about not judging, about really allowing yourself to engage in what do you really want, about savoring that yummy food, about taking the time and that experience to be a positive experience. If you're in an, in an environment where people are talking about fat talk and all of that, it's probably not a time where most children are going to enjoy having chocolate mousse cake. If they're feeling so filled with guilt, even here eating it in that environment. I talk about being a food snob. Not all food you need to eat because it's out there in front of you, but absolutely go and work out what you love and go make sure that you have it and make sure that you're actually allowing yourself to eat that because we're not that pure. We've got several organs that get rid of impurities between kidneys and guts and skin and breathing. We are always able to, we, we, we're not, we don't need to get into orthorexia of just only eating healthy food. That's 
was shown eating disorder in its own right. So I speak to my clients about eating as little possible of these junky, yummy, whatever we want to call it, foods to feel fully satisfied. So eat as little as possible of that food, but make sure that you don't walk away feeling restricted, feeling as if you've been gypped, making sure that you actually are, but also to be mindful. It's not what our bodies from here down need. It is what here up needs. So be present, be in the moment, savor. And that's all what mindfulness is about when it comes to mindful eating. It's about being in the moment, pausing, thinking, am I still tasting it? What's special? What Am I really enjoying this food still? By the way, that is a whole nother talk, which, happy to do it, but it's not sort of within this, this wasn't the main thrust of this, of this talk in terms of intuitive eating and mindful eating, but it is the piece of how we allow our children to have those foods within them making and empowering them to make those choices to include those foods. But I do, um, I do say that you know, we don't have to throw in bear paws into lunches every day because that's what the, the norm is. We don't have to make sure that our children have treats because that's what, because that's habitual. That's habitual eating. I'd rather that the child's actually able to say, Mom, I really feel like an ice cream today. Or could you make that, could we make those, those Rice Krispie squares or, you know, poutine or whatever it might be that your child really enjoys. Let them choose. Let it be a choice rather than a habit. Even when it comes to that, we shouldn't be protecting our children from being exposed to food. It should be a choice that we give our children. And just in conclusion, I'd like to suggest that the messages for our kids are that we should love them for who they are, for what they do, and how they make us feel. There's no perfect body or perfect eating. And we should try to be grateful for everything that our bodies, or that your body, if you're talking to a child, does for you, and take really good care of it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for, um, for plugging in. And um, I hope that I've answered some of your questions today. I know that there are some questions, and I'm going to go to Jalisa for this. I hope yeah. that there's some time. Just give us one second. I believe there was one question. My apologies. Just going to scroll up. Um, regarding food intake, um, it's from Andrew Miller. So how do you handle the teen who is restricting food intake and is resistant to increasing her food intake, especially those teens that are at high risk? For hospital hospitalization, do you have any strategies or suggestions? Okay, so so Andrew, you're looking hi, Andrea. Um, you're looking at what to do with um, the team. Well, it's a very hard question to answer um, on you know because that's a whole lot of eating disorders treatment. In general, um, it's about boosting the like the, what are they what are they saying yes to and what are they saying no to. If they're at risk for um, hospitalization, that could be a discussion in and of itself. You know, are you is your eating disorder taking over to the point that um, that that you are ready to step out of school, ready ready to take that time to like is it just too strong for you? I'm sorry I'm not answering very inclusively, but it's a huge answer, and I don't think that I've got the time for it. Andrew, I'm happy to discuss this with you further, but um, it's not, I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't really have the time for major strategies for that because it's a big conversation. I'm sorry that I can't be more helpful with that one. I think that was pretty much the only question, um, but as Susan said, I would like to thank everyone who took the time out of their busy schedules to view today's webinar. And I'd especially like to thank Susan for bringing our perspectives on guilt-free eating and sharing tips that can be used to empower and educate the children that are in our lives. So once again, if you haven't already, please register for our events and webinars mailing list, and you'll automatically receive the webinar slides and recording. If you'd like to connect with Susan, um, she does have a website, www.susanosher.com. Um, However, it's currently under um, renovation right now. It should be open <laughs> in November. Um, and as she, as she proposed, if you'd like to connect with her, go on her website 
and you'll be able to, um, to do that there. So once again, thank you all. Have a fantastic weekend and happy Halloween. Happy Halloween.